Hello, this is part four of topic four on viscoelastic behavior in MATE 310 and 350. We just finished talking about creep and modeling of creep behavior or viscoelastic creep response in polymers. In this section, I'd like to switch from thinking about creep, which is a constant stress varying strain condition, to stress relaxation, which is constant strain and varying stress. Under a constant applied strain, the stresses within a polymer will gradually decrease over time, as shown by this figure. You can see that when the deformation or strain is initially applied, we get a sudden increase in the stress of the polymer, and then as that strain is held constant, the stress gradually diminishes. This is a phenomenon known as stress relaxation, and it's caused by chain alignment and rotation that reduces the strain and therefore the energy in the system, excuse me, reduces the stress. This is a very common response in biological soft tissues. Uh, your bladder, as it stretches, the tissue relaxes to reduce the likelihood of damage to the bladder. And so we see the classic expansion of volume of the bladder material, and then a sudden increase in the stress with a sudden decrease in the stress in uh, in within the bladder material itself. The same thing occurs in the aorta, so that there's very little damage to the aorta over time with the expansion due to blood flow. Well, if we assume that the strain is constant, epsilon naught, and we apply Hooke's law, we can say that the stress varies as a function of time, and that's equal to the elastic modulus as a function of time also. The relaxation modulus is often given in polymers as a function of time. In other words, if you look up data on polymers, you'll find an elastic modulus for one hour and an elastic modulus for 1,000 hours. And those two values will differ, typically the 1,000 hour elastic modulus being lower than the one hour elastic modulus because of stress relaxation. Now this ER of T, or the relaxation modulus, is a function of temperature, since the polymer chains align with the stress, at, the stress axis more quickly at high temperatures. So for example, if we look at this plot, we have relaxation modulus on a log scale versus time. We see that at very low temperatures, T1, the relaxation modulus doesn't change very much as a function of time. But as you get to higher temperatures, for example T4, the relaxation modulus drops dramatically as a function of time allow because of the allowing of chain rotation and chain alignment. What we often do with this data is plot the elastic modulus at a fixed time, so in this case T1, little t1, for various temperatures and create the stress relaxation temperature curve as illustrated in the next figure. Here we have the relaxation modulus as a function of temperature of the material after one hour of time. This gives us a sense of the stiffness of the polymer as a function of temperature. So at relatively low temperatures, the, the polymer has a high elastic modulus, something on the order of 10 to the third megapascals, or about one gigapascal. In this condition, we would refer to the polymer as glassy. At slightly higher temperatures, the material enters a transition temperature range, and which corresponds to the glass transition temperature, at which point the material becomes leathery. Then the polymer levels out, and the, the relaxation modulus levels out, and we enter into what's known as the rubbery stage, followed by the rubbery flow stage, and finally the viscous flow stage where the relaxation modulus drops off dramatically, orders of magnitude as it becomes a viscous liquid at the melting point. This is a typical curve for a semi-crystalline or amorphous polymer. So C, the curve C, which was discussed earlier, represents the curve for an amorphous polymer. The curve A would be a more crystalline, or nearly completely crystalline polymer, where you have a very small drop at the glass transition temperature and a much larger drop at the melting point as the crystal breaks down. And point B represents that of a lightly cross-linked polymer. The light cross-linking allows for chain conformation and rotation at the glass transition temperature, but notice that there's no melting point for a cross-linked polymer, which results in burning up of the polymer. If we had a heavily cross-linked polymer, we'd expect the same behavior at the melting point, in other words, it just burns up, but the TG effect would be much less, so the curve would come down at the TG and then go out flat somewhere up here. 
the polymer would remain more rigid at high temperatures. We can also consider cyclic loading, not just constant loading. In cyclic loading, we apply a load or force and you have an extension response. And then upon unloading, we notice that the material follows a different curve than the loading curve. The difference between the loading curve and the unloading curve is associated with the energy dissipated by the material or dampened by the material. This is often given off as heat. And in fact, if you cyclically load a polymer at high rates, you can actually feel the polymer sample getting warmer with time as it tries to dissipate heat produced by this energy dissipation. We often want to know how much energy is dissipated as a function, of, as a proportion to the maximum amount of possible energy stored. So the maximum amount of possible energy stored would be the area under the loading curve, and the energy dissipated would be the area between the loading and the unloading curve. And this can be represented as 2 pi tan delta, where delta, or tan delta more correctly, is the loss coefficient. We often measure the loss coefficient using what's called dynamic mechanical analysis. In dynamic mechanical analysis, we take a small sample of polymer and put it between two beams so that it's double cantilevered, um, it's in bending in a double cantilever mode. We then apply a force to the center of the sample using this long rod called the drive shaft connected to a force controlled motor. That force then is applied in a cyclic sine wave pattern as shown here in the graph. We then use a low voltage displacement transducer or LVDT to measure the displacement of the drive shaft as a function of the applied load. And what we often see is that the displacement lags behind the applied force some amount by the, what we call the phase lag or delta. And remember, delta is the loss coefficient of the material. The larger that phase lag, the more absorbing the polymer is of energy. So a material with a high delta value would be very viscoelastic and would tend to absorb more energy uh, in cyclic loading, whereas one with a small delta value would absorb much less energy. We can also use the DMA to do what are called temperature sweeps, to run cyclic loading tests over a range of temperatures. So in this particular material, we notice that there is a small bump in the storage modulus. The storage modulus is very similar to the elastic modulus. You can think of it as the same way. There's a small bump in the elastic modulus as measured by DMA, which represents a what's known as a beta transition in the polymer. You can think of that as a small glass transition temperature. Then we see that there's a huge jump in tan delta, the loss coefficient, at the TG, as well as a tremendous decrease in the storage modulus at TG. So a the solid line represents the mod storage modulus. The dashed line represents tan delta, or the loss coefficient. So at the glass transition temperature, we lose a lot of um, elastic. Mo we lose the elastic modulus, which means the material becomes much more rubbery and less stiff. And we also see the material starts to dampen tremendously at that transition. So we can use the DMA to measure transitions in the material's behavior and identify the location of the glass transition temperature. This is a plot that compares the Young's modulus of a material to its mechanical loss coefficient. And what I want to illustrate here is that for most polymers that are thermoplastics, that's the blue dots, these are typically glassy materials. So their elastic modulus and loss coefficient are tightly correlated. They follow almost a proportional relationship. But when I get to um, thermoplastic elastomers, that's the red dot, or even certainly elastomers, I have lower Young's modulus values and higher loss coefficients that no longer are proportional to one another. And this is typical of cross-linked polymers. We also notice that the rubbers and thermoplastic elastomers in general have higher uh, loss coefficients than 